My name is Britt Koskella. I'm an associate professor at UC Berkeley. And I'm standing here today um, to talk about the virome in health and disease. And so I'm gonna start with a little bit of audience participation. So I need you to get your brains on for a moment. And I would like you to think of a virus. And just the first one that pops into your mind. Who wants to give me a virus? Yes, please. Herpes simplex, great one. Another one? SARS-CoV-2, excellent. One more for good measure. HIV, excellent. So we just heard three pathogenic viruses, and, and you know, I teed you up for that one. Um, indeed, the vast majority of viruses that we study are those that we know cause disease. But the reality is that the virome, the vast diversity of viruses on Earth, we barely understand. And that's a problem, and a problem that is worth solving for many different reasons. For one thing, there is no human health with it without planetary health. And so we're going to start with that topic. And so when we think about the vast array of viruses on Earth, which again, we're just starting to uncover, it turns out that these viruses have very important roles to play in biogeochemical cycling on Earth. So this is work from Matt Sullivan and Ahmed Zayed. It's just an example of a project where, that they've been doing for many, many years as part of a huge team, traveling the oceans, sampling viruses, sequencing them, and discovering more and more novel viruses every day. And just here at ASM Microbe this morning at the climate change session in the EEB, we heard a number of great talks about the role of the soil virome, the marine virome in methane gas, and nitrous oxide gas emissions. So these viruses are important in carbon fixation as well as in greenhouse emissions. Of course, going back to SARS-CoV-2, the vast array of viruses that we don't yet understand in the environment are potential zoonotic or pandemic risk agents. And so many projects, I'm highlighting the PREDICT project here, which is NIH funded, but it's one of many projects that seeks to go out into the environment, for example, in possible zoonotic reservoir hosts and sequence unknown viruses. And so this is just an example of when you do that, when you go into bat caves or other potential spillover sources and you begin sequencing what viruses are there, you discover new viruses all the time. And this is critical if we're going to be prepared, have, vir have um, some idea of potential virulence genes, the vast array of phylogenetic diversity that exists to be prepared for vaccine development and surveillance. Let's switch gears for a moment to something a little bit more close to home. So I asked you to name a virus. Who now can name me a, my, a bacteria in the human microbiome? Yes, please. Prevotella, excellent. Another one? E. coli, yep. Bifidobacter, right? Okay, I'm sure you could, we could keep going on that one because these are becoming well-known organisms. You might drink them in your yogurt, etc. But of course, the human gut is also home to a vast array of viruses. Can someone name me a virus in the human gut microbiome? Norovirus, yep, that's sometimes a very rarely, luckily, in our gut and very unhappy when it ends up there. Perfect. RNA bacteriophage, now we're talking some, my language exactly. So it turns out that our microbiome is also very full of viruses and the more we look, the more we realize that these indeed are linked to health and disease. So a few years ago, NIH launched a program that's parallel to the Human Microbiome Project, but this is the Human Virome Project, to begin uncovering the diversity of viruses that live in and on us, okay? And so they're doing things like tracking human cohorts through time, uh, developing new tools and models for characterizing the virome, and then elucidating the interactions between the human host and this vast array of viruses. Now, these viruses can be viruses that infect us, but the majority of them are viruses that infect bacteria, our microbiome, sometimes as lytic and killing agents of bacteria in the gut, and other times as so-called prophages or temperate phage that can carry important virulence genes, as well as antibiotic resistance, but also just important functions that shape microbiome composition over time. The idea that phages shape human health is not new. 
So this is a figure that from the co-discoverer of phages, Felix Zorel, from one of the original papers of cholera. And what you're looking at here is a, a graph that he made of cholera bacteria causing disease in patients, and he took them out of the stool sample, so he was tracking abundances of cholera bacteria and the abundance of bacteriophages or cholerophages infecting those bacteria. And he put forward the hypothesis at the time that when phage fail to control that bacterial host, the pathogen, that the hosts would die. And indeed, the two patients on the left did not recover from cholera. Whereas occasionally you might have, or maybe most of the time, you have phages that track the bacterial host, kill that pathogen, and reduce disease symptoms. So this is certainly a, not a novel idea that phages are important. But now we're in this resurgence of antibiotic, or this surge in antibiotic resistance, multi-drug resistant bacterial pathogens, and there's a renewed interest in phage therapy. And this is a very huge topic at the moment and, and a very active area of research. But what I actually want to do for the last couple of slides here is not think about pathogens. I want to tell you about all of the different ways that the viruses in the gut might change human health. And I'm going to start with plants. The reason I'm starting with plants is because that's the lab, the, the model system that we use in my lab, and it's a nice experimental system for testing these principles, for doing experiments, and asking how phages might change health and disease. And so this here is work uh, run by uh, Rena Debray, who was a graduate student in the time and is now at Max Planck Institute as a junior le leader, and Asa Conover, who's a graduate student in my group. And what Rena and Asa did is that the most recent, if you'd like it, I put the, um, the QR code here, the most recent work that we've done in this line of evidence where we take a microbiome, in this case, it happens to be from a tomato growing outside in, in a field, and we size separate that microbiome into the viral fraction or the bacterial fraction. And then we inoculate plants with either the bacterial fraction alone, we call it phage depleted, right, it has less bacteriophage, or we recombine that bacterial microbiome with the phages with, it, with which it was naturally occurring. In this case, what we did is we inoculated plants with that, that consortia, or the phage alone, I should add, and then, after the microbiome had established for a few days, we challenged those plant hosts with a known plant pathogen, in this case, a bacterial pathogen, Pseudomonas syringae. And what I hope you can see here is that on the left in purple, we have the Pseudomonas syringae pathogen by itself. And you're looking at how much disease happened over the course of us monitoring these plants, and it causes disease. When we add just the bacterial microbiome, you see that disease is slightly reduced, but not much. But when you recombine the phage and the microbiome together, then we see clear disease protection. And that disease protection was not direct killing of the phage, of the pathogen, sorry, by the phage, because the phage treatment alone does not confer this. And in fact, we've also looked for placking and, and ability to kill the, the pathogen. And so this is building on a line of evidence that phages are critical to bacterial microbiome homeostasis. And indeed, we and others have showed that phages are critical to maintaining microbiome diversity and how many species there are. And the reason it does that the, the phages can do this is something that we call kill the winner or negative frequency dependent selection. And it's an idea that's been around in evolutionary biology for a long time. It's simply that phages are mediators of diversity. And in this particular case, we mean that phages adapt to any bacteria that is overgrowing, becoming too dominant, too competitive in a microbiome. And by specifically killing those bacteria, making space for more rare bacterial types. And that when you maintain bacterial diversity, as phages are doing all the time, that that can in, in, um, impart important functions like disease resistance in this case. Now, just to end on a non-plant note, uh, in collaboration uh, with Rachel Wheatley, who's just started her own research group um, in, um, in England, and then Dominique Holtapels, who's a postdoc in my lab at the moment, um, we surveyed the existing literature of microbiomes that had been studied for both virome and microbiome diversity in published literature. And we screened specifically for papers that looked at a dysbiotic system, and by that I simply mean a system 
that had been perturbed, and I allowed, we allowed the authors to determine what that was, and it ranged from HIV infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection, Crohn's disease, um, obesity, et cetera. So we, we lumped all of these dysbioses together to ask a very simple question, which is, can phages be a signature of a microbiome dysbiosis? And I'm only showing you one small taste of the results we have here. This is now pre-printed if you're interested. But the takeaway was that sometimes you actually have significant loss of viruses in dysbiosis. Sometimes you have more phage than you might expect. But something I'm not showing you here that was the key signature was that in dysbiosis, the natural relationship, the positive correlation between bacterial diversity and phage diversity broke down. And so take this as you want. You could, we have, of course, in this case, not shown causation. These are all correlative observational studies, but I previously showed you an experiment where we directly manipulated this. I think all of the evidence is coming together to say a few different things. One of them is that the virome is worth our time and effort to characterize and study, partially because it plays a role in health and disease and likely a very causative role in microbiome homeostasis and diversity maintenance. But also, these viromes might be important and potentially cheap signatures of diseases and dysbioses that we're interested in monitoring. And so as sequencing costs continue to come down and we learn more about this dark matter of viruses in the human gut and on Earth, we'll have the ability to quickly detect when things go wrong. But or particularly for the trainees, uh, I want to say that um, in this field, there are far more questions than answers and we need help. We need young minds to come and help us uncover all of this viral diversity and make sense of it especially with all of the remarkable amounts of data coming online, great bioinformaticians, great hypotheses. So with that, I will thank you.